you will turn in your Bibles with me to uh, Matthew chapter 5. If you can, please put a bookmark in Luke chapter 8. I'm going to get to those in a moment. But if you're taking notes, I encourage you to take notes. Matthew 5 and then Luke chapter 8. I'll, I'll get there in just a second. I have the honor to continue our DNA series. And I know it's been amazing. Pastor Daniel kicked off the first two weeks. Come on, how many love that? It was incredible. Okay, come on. That's like a golf clap. Come on, somebody. I know you did. I saw everybody crying. It was there. I was crying. I said it was amazing. Talked about there's a war for your worship, and your worship is worth it. It's worth it to worship God because no matter what's going on around you, it's not near as powerful as the Jesus that's on the inside of you, right? If you missed it, go check it out on YouTube, our YouTube channel. You don't want to miss it. I have the honor for week three of teaching in this DNA series, and here's our theme scripture. It's found in Colossians 3.17 for the whole series. In whatever, somebody shout whatever. Whatever. Whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Whatever you do, if you really want to know the DNA, what it is to be a believer, what it is to be a disciple of Jesus, Here's the the DNA and the heart and soul of the gospel. And that's this, to love God and to love people. You can say it this way. The heart of this house is that Jesus is the message and people are the mission. If you love God, the question is, how many love God, by the way? Come on, just show your hands. How many love Jesus? Like You love him, right? I know you do. But my question is, is your love for people just as equal as your love for God? It's part of who we are. If it's who Jesus was. John 1.1, 1, 1, the word became flesh. He is the word. This is who Jesus was. This is who we need to be. This is what God has called us to be. So I want to talk to you, Dave, on do you have a heart for people? What is, what is your heart for people? Because I know something about this. The house heals. How many know there's something about the house? That God's healing is right here in the middle of it. Amen on that? Y'all ready? Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much. We pray right now, Holy Spirit, take over. Do what only you can do, Jesus. Pray right now, you open up our hearts. You open up our minds. You open up our eyes to have a passion for people like never before. Be able to see the needs that are around us, God. And we thank you for it. Father, while we're here together, it says when two or more are gathered in your name, we can declare and believe that the Houston Cougars are going to win the national championship, Lord. And baseball season has already started, so we might as well declare it, that the Astros are going to go back-to-back in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen. Amen. Come on, put your hands together one more time for God's word. Can we do it? A heart, a heart for people. Look in your Bibles in Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to start with verse 13. Jesus gives us three things that he challenges our heart with, that we need to be as a follower of Christ. Verse 13 says, let me tell you why you are here. Just just listen to God's voice speaking into your heart right now this morning. Hey, let me tell you why you're here, guys. You're on this earth. He says, you are here to be salt. Everybody shout salt. salt. Underline that word in your Bible if you got it. Salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of the earth. Skip down to verse 14. It's another way to put it. You are here to be light. Somebody shout light. Light. Burning out the God colors in the world. And I love this phrase. God is not a secret to be kept. It's not a check in and check out on Sundays. But when we get here, we take it out there to people. He says this. Here's why. Because we go in public with this. As public as a city on a hill. If I make you a light bearer, You don't think I'm going to hide you underneath the bucket, do you? But I'm putting you on a light stand. In other words, every person's got a purpose. Verse 16, now that I've put you there on the hilltop, on a light stand, I need you to shine. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, shine. And look at your second choice and say, you too, shine. Then all of this phrase, here's the third challenge from God. Here it is, three words. Keep an open house. The Bible says our heart is like a house. Everybody say, keep an open heart. He says, be generous with your lives by opening up to others. That means serving and loving people. And it will prompt people 
to open up with God. By simply how you love them will open up their heart to God because how you love God and how you love them. So there's this challenge here that we're going to break down today. God has called every single one of us the very DNA of a believer and who you are called to be in Jesus. You're called to be salt, called to be light. We're called to keep an open heart, an open house. We are called to help people. When I think about this, I think about my daughter. When she was about four years old, I'll never forget that she wanted just this one thing and one thing only for her birthday. It's like, if I can get this dad, you're going to be the best dad in the world. Come on, how many know you're the best dad in the world when you get them what they want? I don't know, right? So, and so, by the way, how many parents are here? Are you glad spring break is coming, or spring break is over? Thank you, Monday. Come on, somebody. Where you at? Praise Jesus. Me too. But I'll never forget, she wanted this one thing for her birthday. She wanted a Tinkerbell outfit. But it wasn't just any Tinkerbell outfit. It was specific. It was the brand new pirate Tinkerbell outfit. So I'm like, all right, I got this. I'm going to be dad of the year. And all of a sudden, I did something that I'm sure no other parent has done before. But you waited till the last second to go get the present. Come on, anybody? Anybody willing to be honest in church that that's you? Come on. Y'all lying in church? Come on, put your hands up. <laughs> Am I right? And all of a sudden, I find myself, I'm like, I'm going to go get this on the last day because our party's that night. And all of a sudden, I start freaking out. I ran up to Target. I went up to Walmart. All of a sudden, after about the fourth store, I cannot find a pirate Tinkerbell outfit, and I start freaking out, realizing, oh my gosh, the rest of the city of Houston have the same idea as me. And I start worrying. I start freaking out. Oh my God, and all of a sudden, I'm, I'm, I kid you not, I hit up 10 stores, and then I hit up the 11th store, and then all of a sudden, how many know the Lord comes in the midnight hour? Can I get an amen in the house? And I kid you not, the 12th store that I walked into in the Target in the Meyerland area, I walked down the kids' aisle, and there was one pirate Tinkerbell outfit left for me. It was like the Lord said, I love you, you a good man, and you ain't never seen a grown man grab a pirate Tinkerbell outfit and skip through Target. I got it! I kid you not, I'm running up to people, I got it! Ah! They're like, this is a crazy white boy. I, I never thought I'd be so passionate about something to find for my daughter. But here's what I realized, friends. The Lord taught me something to that. You can't love somebody and not love what they love. You can't say, Jesus, I love you, and not love what he loves. And you know what he loves? He loves people. You can't, God, I, I love you. you. You're amazing. I need you in my life, God. And then say you don't need people in your life. It is literally built into the DNA of who we are. God said, I need you to be salt. We all know what salt is. We all know that salt has a purpose because if there's something that we're eating that doesn't taste very good or it's not satisfying, put a little salt on it, come on in, right? And all of a sudden, it's desirable again. For all my Louisiana family, you put a little Tony's on there. Come on, am I right? Let's go. Where's my Tony's fam in the house? Just wave at her brother. This is exactly how God has called us to be. God has called, I need you to be salt to people. No matter where you meet them at, no matter what their level of brokenness might be, our job is to walk with Jesus in such a way to make them realize there's something different about you. I don't know what you got, but I want what you got. And you got to remind them and say, it is Jesus in my life that made everything better. And if you want your life to get better, you want your marriage and your family and your situation to get better, put a little bit of Jesus in it and it makes bad things good again. It's desirable. Even in scripture back in the day at the temple in Jerusalem, when Jesus had his ministry. They would sprinkle salt on the ramp leading up to, uh, to the temple where people encountered the Lord. And I could see Jesus in a way. I don't know if he taught it in this exact moment, but I believe Jesus, he used illustrations all the time. I can literally see Jesus at the footsteps of the temple in Jerusalem and talking to his disciples saying, hey, as they put salt on the ramp, leading people to an encounter with Jesus in the temple, so also should your lives be. To where everything you do, you're either leading people to Jesus or you're leading them away from Jesus. Every room that you walk into, are you making it brighter or are you making it darker? 
You were called to be salt. Can I tell you right now, God can use everyone and anyone. Every person in this room, God wants to use. Every person in this room, we need you. We're a big family in here. Somebody shout, we family. Come on, am I right? Everything can't be done from this stage. But we're in this thing together. And how can you bring Jesus to your world and to your neighbor and to your friends, your place of work, your school, wherever you might be that God has you, you can be salt. But I want to show you God can, God can use anybody. I don't want you to think that, well, that's easy for you, Barbara. You're, you're up there and you're a, pre, you're a preacher. You can communicate. Of course you can win. No, 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 no. God can use you just as much as he uses us. He wants to use everyone. Look at Luke chapter 8. I want to show you Team Jesus. We all know, This is later on in the ministry of Jesus. In the beginning, Jesus found 12 disciples, and he called them to come with him. But as the ministry of Jesus grew over three years, there was more people added to the team. There was a diversity of, of leaders with the 12 disciples. But I want you to see something. God uses this illustration in Luke chapter 8. There's a few women that he described that come from different backgrounds and places that fit Team Jesus to build the local church. In fact, I think the ministry of Jesus, he was the original portable church. He started with the launch team. He started a church. He went from town and village and everywhere, and everywhere he went, he popped up church. Yo, I'm the hope of the world. Led people to Jesus, got people discipled, and then he went somewhere else. And people joined in on the team. It wasn't just Jesus. It was the family and the local church together reaching the city and the nations. So I want to show you this. Luke chapter 8, verse 1, 3. Y'all still with me? Can I get a yeah? Come on. It says, after this, Jesus traveled about from town and village to another. That's why we say from neighborhoods to nations, God is reaching people. Proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. It says the 12 were with him, the 12 disciples. Verse 2, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and disease, Mary from which seven demons had come out. Verse 3, Joanna, she was the manager of Herod's household. Then it says Susanna and many others. Now, why would the Lord be this detail in Scripture? It has to have a purpose. I think God was showing us the beauty of, the diversity of the ministry of Jesus and the church of Jesus. It says, Mary, she was a lady that had seven demons inside of her that had to be cast out. Let me tell you right now, think about the mental illness, the pain. Think about the struggle, the addiction. She came off the streets. Think about the reputation that she had. But until she met Jesus, everything changed. The moment she met Jesus, her entire life was flipped upside down. And Jesus valued her so much. Think about this. He could have picked anybody to announce his resurrection at the tomb. But he loved Mary so much. He said, hey, I need you to go and tell the world I'm alive, I'm not dead, and we just getting started building the local church in this thing. I want you to see it, though. A woman, a person from extreme brokenness found the grace of Jesus. She can be used in the family of God in the local church. Then you see, you see Joanna. Joanna was the CEO of King Herod's household. She had a title. She had influence in the city. She had resources. She was born into wealth. She was financially blessed. Her entire life, she always had more than what she needed. Even though there was something deep inside of her that was still empty, she's been blessed in every area of her life, but it wasn't until she met Jesus that she realized what her more was for. And she said, I'm going to join the local church. and Because of Jesus, I'm going to get everything I got through financially giving, through influence in the city, to continue to build and to reach people. Here's a lady from extreme brokenness and a lady who's got everything, and they both fit in to the house of God. Then you got, you got Susanna. It says Susanna and many others. The Bible doesn't tell us about her past, doesn't tell us about her future, doesn't even, doesn't even have a title, 
Maybe she represents the rest of us who are kind of all in between. Maybe she just represents, you could call it average, or maybe you just call it like, I like to think, maybe, maybe she was a B and C student like me. Come on, somebody, anybody else? Like some people graduate soon from Lottie. I don't know about y'all, but I graduated with, thank you, Lordy. Come on, anybody, just wave at her, brother. Jesus, I just made it, thank you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But don't you love the heart of God in his house? Come on, church, do you see this? There's somebody from extreme brokenness, Somebody who's got everything and more that they can give. And everybody in between can be a part of the house of God. From the penthouse to the outhouse to all in between, every person has a role. Every person has a position. Every person is valued in the house of God. And God needs you. He needs his family. Are you with me? It's the heart of God. The heart is to love people right where they are. Help them get to where they're going. This is the local church. It's, it's beautiful. Then God says, hey, I need you to be light. Everybody shout light. light. Come on, you got to shout it louder than that. Come on, somebody shout light. 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 To love people is this. Here's the, here's the heart of the culture. The DNA of you and the DNA of our house. You can write this down if you want. If we do the loving, then God does the healing. If we do the loving then God does the healing. Because can I tell you right now, the house heals. How many know God's house, there is healing, right? There's just something when you get up in this house and you hear the team singing Firm Foundation and other songs, can you not help? How many feel a move of God and the Holy Spirit when you just get in the house? There's something about the house that if you could just, I, I tell people in the streets all the time or if they're broken in the shrub, I said, hey, just get here on Sunday. Because being here on Sunday will help you Monday through Saturday. There's something about being in the house. The house heals. When I think about this, I think about in the book of Luke. I think about a story with a man by the name of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus and Jesus have an encounter and they meet. The Bible says Zacchaeus wasn't just a sinner. The Bible says he was a notorious sinner. Have you ever met somebody like they sinned well? Come on, anybody, when you were a sinner, did you sin well like me? Come on, right like, when you sin, you sin. <laughs> then you met Jesus. Come on. The Bible says he was a notorious sinner. In fact, he ran the streets. He was probably the original drug lord, the original pimp, the original kingpin. Here he is. He ran the streets with his entourage, and then all of a sudden, you got Jesus, who's got his entourage, and he's walking the streets too, and Zacchaeus ain't happy with it. He's like, who is this dude? He's messing up my business. These are my streets. And I can literally see it where, where Jesus is walking down the streets in the entourage about to walk up on Zacchaeus' house and Zacchaeus sees him from the roof and he walks down the house and him and Jesus meet right in the middle of the street. And then something amazing happens. In fact, Jesus, if you go back and read it, Jesus got bashed and criticized for it. But how many know the heart of Jesus is to love people right where they are? The Bible says that Jesus followed Zacchaeus into the house. Now, the Bible does not tell us what happened in the house. I don't know if they were in there, sitting in the hot tub, eating goat wings and watching camel racing. I don't know what was happening. Some of y'all are going to catch that in like five seconds. But here's what I do know. Something happened in the house. Because outside the house, Zacchaeus called him Jesus. But when he left the house after spending time with Jesus, he called him Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Something shifted on the inside of him. There's something about when you get in to the house of God, the house heals. Yeah. And if we do the loving, then God does the healing. How many of us show of hands? How many of you have been in a church service and in the house of God and God has radically changed your life? Come on, anybody. Come on, how many believe in the healing touch of Jesus, right? This is, this is why I need church. This is why I need the house of God. I don't know about you, but if I can be very transparent, the house has saved my family. The house has saved my marriage. The house has set me free from addiction. The house has set me free from depression and suicidal thoughts and anxiety. There is something about being in the house that heals everything. That God heals us mentally and he heals us physically. 
I'll never forget I had a freak accident in college where I hit a guy in football. I just want y'all to know, I delivered the blow. He didn't, blow, he didn't knock me out. I indented the whole face mask. Come on, somebody. How many know when you hit somebody in football and you hear him go, oh, that's a good hit, right? And I knocked this dude out, but I woke up, went completely blind in my right eye. And if it wasn't for my connect group, a part of the house, they came and laid hand on me to believe God for a supernatural healing. Can I tell you, God supernaturally brought my high side back just the moment we began to pray. It freaked the doctors out. The doctors, when they did the scan, the brain scan, they're like, you have to have at least a dot on your retina to show that you've lost sight. He said, we can't find nothing. I said, I know. That's how good my God is. He's a good God. He's a healer. But it happened in the house. It happened being part of a connect group. Can I tell you, the house heals. It's what it's all about. I need this house. Every person you meet needs this house. And one of the things that breaks my heart the most, y'all know the, y'all know the story where they met the paralyzed man in the Bible, met the paralyzed man outside the house. It was so packed. Jesus was in the house. They went to the rooftop and they dropped them in. Y'all remember that story? It's an amazing story. We need to celebrate. But you know what breaks my heart the most? It's the hundreds of people that passed the paralyzed man by to get into the house. How many people are we passing by through Starbucks? How many people are we passing by through the Gospel Bird, Chick-fil-A? How many people? Come on, it's okay to laugh in church. It's okay. <laughs> what about your neighbor? What about your friends? What about your coworkers? What about your students? They can, take prayer out, they can take prayer out of school, but they can't take prayer in the name of Jesus out of our students. Come on, somebody. Are you with me? Like, There's something about getting people into the house because here's what you got to lean in. When we say yes to a moment, God will turn it into a movement. God is saying, I'm creating some moments in your life for people. Will you say yes to be there for a moment? To create a moment of a movement of life change. I'll never forget my boy Mario. I was on my way to church, and I stopped to fill up on gas, and how many of you know, just for some reason, the Holy Spirit shows up on Sunday when I stop at Bucky's and then I come to church. Come on, there's just something about it. Come on, how many love some Bucky's? Let's go. Where are you at? So I'll never forget my boy, my boy Mario. Uh, he was a homeless man. And I, remember, I remember grabbing him, the Holy Spirit said, hey, take him to church. So I want to talk to him and say, hey, buddy, I need you to come. I want you to come to church with me. I want you to be my guest. Come sit with me on the front row. I think God's got, got something for you. We had a great morning that morning, and it looked like God really kind of moved on Mario's life, and he wasn't very talkative about it. I said, hey, promise me, Mario, here's what I need from you. I just need you to come back to church. Just get here on Sunday. We're going to help you. We're going to be with you. Two, three weeks go by. I don't see my boy Mario. Like, where, where, man, I can't stop thinking about him. Like, where are you at? Three years go by. And all of a sudden, I'm in, I'm in a men's prison in East Texas. We're about to have a church service. There's about 500 guys in the church service. I'm on the front row, like shaking hands and talking to some guys. And I see this dude all the way in the back right corner. He's just back there like. <laughs> I'm like, who is that? And he, he just wouldn't stop. I can tell he's trying to get my attention. <laughs> and I, I took a double take. And I was like, Mario? It was my dude, Mario. And I went up to Mario, and I hugged his neck, and he hugged me, held on for like 30 seconds. And he said, bro, I'm so sorry I didn't make it to church. The popo picked me up that night. <laughs> True story. I said, well, that explains a lot, Mario. <laughs> but I'll never forget, tears begin to run down his face. He said, I can't thank you enough for that moment. He said, I know that I'm in prison, but I want you to know I'm freer in here than I ever were in the streets. I've committed my life to Jesus. My family has gotten back together. I'm at church every weekend. I'm working for the chaplain. Thank you. Because of that moment, it started a movement in my life. Oh, come on, Hope City. Come on. Are you with me? Like, this is what it's all about. If we do the loving, God does, does the healing. He does the healing. The question is, how many moments is God crossing your path on a daily basis to say yes to? You got Easter coming up. The greatest opportunity to invite people to church. 
Because there's something about being here. If God has touched you, why wouldn't you want every single person to have the same experience with you? I don't know about you, but I want every single one of y'all and everybody that I meet, I want to be dancing in heaven and not in hell. Come on. Are you with me? We're going to party in heaven together. Here's what you got to understand. You got to recognize that you're somebody's answered prayer. You are somebody's answered prayer. You're called to be light. There's a story in John 21 where Peter and Jesus meet at the Sea of Galilee. This isn't the first time that Peter and Jesus met. If you remember the first time that Jesus met Peter, it was at the Sea of Galilee, but Jesus walked up to Peter and said, hey, come and follow me and I will make you, if you know it, fishers of men. Peter was a fisherman. So he said, hey, come and meet me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Come follow me. Then all of a sudden, you fast forward to John chapter 21. I want you to go back and read it later. John chapter 21, Peter denied Jesus. Jesus already died on the cross, rose from the dead. Peter left the church. He went back to his old ways. He went back to the Sea of Galilee, and we find in John 21, Jesus went back, and he met Peter where he first found him. Jesus knew how to love people right where they were. But then they have a conversation that's totally different. First time he met Peter, he talked to him like a fisherman. But this time, John 21, he talked to him different. Y'all remember the story? He looked at Peter and he said, Peter, do you love me? Feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Take care of my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Now, why in the world this moment, did the first time Jesus talked to Peter, talk to him like a fisherman, but this time he talked to him like a shepherd. Maybe God was calling him to a higher place. Maybe God was saying, hey, you can play with childish things, but you're a believer of Jesus, the DNA of who you are. We got to take it up a notch if you're going to reach people. Why, why, why did this happen? We'll understand the context of the scene. Every fisherman, every fisherman that they, uh, when they went out to fish, the Romans would tax every fish that they caught. So when they went out to fish, they wouldn't keep everything. They'd actually kind of pick and choose what they were going to keep because there was a cost to it. How do we know that? If you go back and you read in the story in John 21, the Bible says that on the shore, there were exactly 153 fish. Some theologians believe that that 153 represented the 153 known nations of the world. Maybe Jesus was sitting there saying, hey, I need you to go from neighborhoods to nations to, to build the local church and reach people. But then I also think that Jesus had a different twist. He's saying, Peter, I'm going to talk to you like a shepherd right now. If you can set the scene right before this moment and before Peter denied Jesus, Jesus looked at Peter and says, Peter, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Upon you, Peter, you were called to be an answer prayer. And Peter remembers that moment. And Peter, Jesus says, Peter, if you're going to reach a city, and if you're going to love people, I can't have you loving people like you fish thinking there's a cost, thinking is it worth it? Should we go to third ward? Should we go to fifth ward? Should we go to the prison? Should we go to the streets? You, you think it, it costs too much or it ain't worth it or it's not the investment and we gotta do more campuses. Why do more camp? We gotta do all those things. No, 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 Peter. I can't have you loving people like you fish. I need you to love people like a shepherd because a fisherman will pick and choose, but a shepherd will leave the 99 for the one. A fisherman will run away from the storm. But a shepherd said, yo, bring it on. Send me a bear. Send me a lion. Send me a giant. Bring whatever you got, devil. Ain't nothing going to stop me from reaching people. Ain't nothing going to stop me from reaching this city. Because we won't stop until everybody knows the name of Jesus. So why do I say this? Why do I say this? May we have eyes like Jesus where we don't pick and choose who gets grace. We don't pick and choose who needs to be in this house. And also our pastors, incredible shepherds of this house,
Can I tell you right now? They can't do it alone. We can't reach everybody from this platform. Just like Jesus turned to Peter, I'm turning to you. You know what I see in this room? I see a bunch of shepherds in this room. God is asking you, you help us build this church by how we love people. We stand with me as we close. We shouldn't share this last thought. How many glad you came to church today? Come on, anybody? Here's my last thought with you. Lean in. Don't, don't want to leave yet. Boobies are still open. Come on. Here's the last thing I want to leave with you. Is I need you to value. I'm asking this from the heart of our pastors, our church, and our team, and the heart of God. I need, I'm asking you, will you value a heart for diversity? And I'm not just talking about racial diversity. Look around you. There's an anointing on this house where you can't see the majority. But God has blessed this house with racial diversity that's going to look just like heaven. Can we celebrate that? Come on. God is an amazing God. But here's what I'm asking. I'm asking this. Please hear me. I'm asking, will you have the same heart for the diversity of brokenness. The diver- we all come from different parts of the streets and backgrounds. God has called us to be a hospital. In fact, before hospitals became their own, the hospitals were in the local church. God has called us to be a hospital. And when you're a hospital, you're going to see some mess. It's some messy people. And every hospital has an ambulance. And it goes out to the streets. Can I tell you, that's what missions is. That's what local outreach is. Even Jesus himself, he didn't go from the manger to the cross. He went from the manger to the streets and to the cross saying, I came to see you. Now I need you to come and see me. That's the heart of this house. We're going out to the streets and to the nations. But to get into the house, because the house but can you be okay to love the diversity of brokenness? That it doesn't matter who walks up in this place, whether they're homeless, whether they're getting a sports coat, cowboy boots, three-piece suit, and some gators. Come on, somebody. Whether they're, whether they're fresh off the street, fresh out of prison, whether they got tats all over, eye tats, it don't matter what it looks like. What matters is that we love people right where they are to where we believe that God can take them to be. Come on, Old City, you're with me. Let's value the diversity of brokenness. Whether they sit in the front or sit in the back, help me love. Because the local church is here to meet people on their worst day. What a better place than the house of God. Pastor Daniel said, quoted an Instagram quote. It was beautiful. Stirred my heart for this message. I've never heard it put this way. But I want you to think about this. God has never, you have never, you, you have never looked into the eyes of somebody that God didn't love. That's why prison ministry, I'm a unique cat. Throw me in the street and throw me in the depths of the prison to love people. It energizes me. And in the house of God. But prison taught me how to love people. I love the person and not the situation. And there's people in our lives all around. This house is needed in this city. To love people right where they are. To help them get to where they're going. No matter what they look like. And no matter where they are in life. Can I tell you friends? Because people are going to walk in here. They need help in their marriage. And we can help them restore their marriage and their family. There's going to be people that walk in here. And they've been in homelessness. We can help them find housing. People in poverty, we can help them get out with a with a financial game plan. We can help you. People in addiction, we can help you find recovery. But if somebody dies not knowing Jesus, they're going to be hit with a blow from hell that they can never recover from. This is why we exist. We want to do it together. If you ain't signed up to be a part of the team, you need to hit that blue tent on the way out today and say, I want in. 
I want in on what God is doing. I'm going to join a connect group. I'm going to start giving. I'm going to start serving. I'm going to join the missions team. I'm going to serve the parking team. I'm going to serve whatever because the Jesus that I know, I want every person to walk into this house and meet the same Jesus because the house heals. Can we do that together, family? I want to shift this to you because our time is up. Some of you that are in this room, you're at a different place of brokenness, and I'm not sure where it is. Maybe you're believing God for your marriage, your family. Maybe some of you are suffering the addiction. It's, just, it's a deep secret place that you've yet to let the Lord know about. I mean, you've let not let people know about, but the Lord knows it. I don't know where you fit in this, but can I remind you, wherever you are in your level of brokenness, Jesus said, I've never left you or forsaken you. If you let me in in this moment, I'll turn it into a movement of change in your life. Everything will shift. Will you bow your head and close your eyes? And I ask you in just a moment, on the count of three, with boldness, I'm going to ask you to throw up your hand if you mean this. Jesus didn't die on the cross to be a part of your top three. There's somebody in your room, forget who's around you. Don't let shame and embarrassment stop you. This is you in heaven. You're in here today. You need to give your life to Jesus for the first time. There's some of you who need to rededicate your life because you were closer to God at one point, but you're not as close as you are right now. You think you're so broken, there ain't no way somebody or God can love you. But let me tell you right now, God loves you right where you are. So on the count of three, I'm going to ask with boldness. By throwing your head up, you're letting heaven and Jesus know that I want you in my life. I want Jesus at the center of my world. On the count of three, I want you to throw your hand up. Ready? One, two, three. Throw your hand up and keep it up. Come on, everybody up. Come on, just keep it up for me. I'm not trying to get a photo. I just want you to make a statement with heaven. Come on, keep your hand up. Come on, there's hands going up everywhere. Come on, whole city. The Bible says when one comes to heaven, all of heaven throws a party. Come on, we better throw a party right now. There's hands going up everywhere. God is so good. He is so good. Now, here's what I want us to do. I want us to praise the family. Come on, everybody. Can you just throw your hands up for me? Come on, everybody, throw your hands up. We're going to close out strong with this prayer and finish with the moment of worship. How many glad you came to church today? Come on, amen. God is moving in this house. Come on, every hand up. Come on, shout this prayer together as a family. Say, Jesus. Come on, shout it louder. Say, Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for shedding your blood for me. Today, Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. Today, I choose to follow you. In Jesus' name. Come on, if you believe in Hope City, come on, put your hands together. Oh, come on, we can do better than that. Come on, throw your hands up. How many thankful Jesus is a firm foundation?